Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Tasmania online series for Alumni Explore. Firstly, as we all join from across the country and as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people and custodians of the land upon which we meet. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Rebecca Cuthill and I'm the Director of Advancement, Managing Alumni and Philanthropy at the University of Tasmania. This series Explore provides an opportunity specifically for you, alumni of the University of Tasmania, for ideas and inspiration. One of the great advantages of being a member of the alumni community is the ability to tap into a group of influential individuals with vast global impact. This series offers an exclusive opportunity to connect with your peers and to find among them innovators, thought leaders, and perhaps even potential collaborators. You are such an important part of the fabric of the university. And that is why we're providing opportunities to access webinars tailored to your needs, such as this one this afternoon. Before today's conversation gets underway, I have to explain a few housekeeping notes. You will note your microphone, camera, chat function and raised hand function have all been disabled, so our guests as they speak are not interrupted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions of our presenters today, and this can be done by typing them into the Q&A function you'll see on your screens. And finally, I just need to let you know this conversation is being recorded for later access on our YouTube channel. So today's subject, sustainability. It's the front of mind for many people right now as we see the very real impact of climate change across the globe. One question we face is how can we make changes in our own lives and also on a larger scale? To provide some answers to this question today, we're really lucky to be joined by two alumni from the University of Tasmania. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce you now to our two presenters, Professor Martin Grimmer and Dr. Catherine Elliott. Professor Martin Grimmer is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at the University of Tasmania and a Professor of Marketing. He's an organisational psychologist with a focus on consumer behaviour and specialises in pro-environmental and sustainable consumption. He re researches the effect of corporate reputation and green marketing communications on consumer purchase behaviour and the ex extent to which any effects are moderated by factors such as price, or environmental involvement. Martin has looked at consumer attitudinal change, why consumers don't always do what they say, and the measurement of environmental concern. Dr. Catherine Elliott is a University of Tasmania alumna who completed her BA ONS in 2007 and a PhD in 2015. She's the Senior Sustainability Officer at the University of Tasmania and the coordinator of the Sustainability Integration Program for Students, or as it's known, SIPS. It's an award-winning program that provides opportunities for students to work on projects that tackle real-world sustainability challenges. Catherine is also the facilitator of the Education for Sustainability Tasmania Communities of Practice, as well as a member of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Tasmania Network. She's directly mentored many students on sustainability projects and engaged hundreds more in sustainability initiatives across the university. We're incredibly grateful to have both our presenters here today. Welcome, Martin and Catherine. Martin, we'll begin with you today as you provide us with some insights of the relationship between climate change and consumer behaviour. Look, thanks so much, Rebecca, and, and thanks, everyone. Um, very pleased to be here and, and uh, talk about an area that I've been involved in for quite a few years now. And, and welcome to all the, everyone who's joined us today. Um, as um, uh, Rebecca introduced, I'm an organisational psychologist, but um, most of what I do in terms of my research is focused on marketing and, in particular, the ethical aspect of consumer behaviour. And so what I want to do is, is start with a few... Um, I suppose, insights that I've had looking into this area for a little while, a little bit of the research I've been involved in, and then a, a, a little bit more of a look at um, how we can change behaviour from a consumer behaviour point of view. Um, so having looked at, um, looked at this area uh, 
quite extensively, there's a number of conclusions I've come to uh, in, in looking at climate change and consumer behaviour or sustainability and consumer behaviour. Um, one is that the relationship between issues such as climate change and sustainability and consumer behaviour is a complex one. Um, there are many, many factors that impact on um, what a consumer will actually do that kind of gets in the way of them doing what they say they're going to do. So I am regularly um, um, surprised, though I shouldn't be, by the fact that consumers don't do what they say they're going to do. So as I've got here, many consumers will express their intention to buy an environmentally friendly product, but don't actually do so. There's a phenomenon that's called the 30 to 3 syndrome. Um, don't get too worried about the actual numbers because they, they fluctuate a little bit depending on what part of the world we're in, what issue we're talking about, and what else is going on in the world. So if there are other issues of importance, then the environment either goes up or down in terms of people's concern. But the principle is roughly that the third consumers will say they are concerned about a firm's social responsibility. So a, a company that you're buying products from, their ethical responsibilities, but ethical products themselves only get about a 3% market share. So it's a 30 to 3 problem. So you basically got about a 10% uptake, even from the people who say that they are interested in the environment and they're concerned about social responsibilities. So I started to think, well, why is that the case? Why is it that consumers don't do what they say? Um, and one of the big issues uh, that we come to is that most consumers simply are not capable of determining which behaviour changes are worth doing because it's very complicated. Most consumers are unable to assess, for example, the carbon implication of a particular behaviour because it's too complicated and there are too many things to do. Um, so what I'd, like to, what I'd like to go through now just quickly are a couple of examples of research that I've been involved in that trying to unpack why that is the case. Um, and so I'll start with um, um, this, this finding that I did with my, my wonderful uh, colleague, uh, Tim Bingham, where we were surveyed just shy of 700 Hobart consumers and said, how likely are you to purchase a mobile phone from XX company, we use real companies, uh, with either a low or a high environmental performance? <clears throat> Excuse me. And we took that information from a Greenpeace Green Product Guide, so it was actually real information, and said, okay, on the left-hand side of that, of that graph, you've got likelihood, so obviously the higher the number, the greater the likelihood, and then presented different groups of, of consumers with different phones, which had a different uh, environmental performance rating. And overwhelmingly, people said that they would be much more likely to purchase a phone from a company with high environmental performance. So that's good. However, we can then break it down a bit further and we start to see what some of the complexity is. So on the left-hand side, I've got what we would call an internal um, um, uh, motivation, which is level of environmental consciousness. And on the right-hand side, we have what we would call an external motivation, which is price. Um, and so if you look at that graph on the left, you can see that, and the light green is the high environmental performing company, you can see that, no matter the level of environmental consciousness, people are still more likely to buy from a company with a high environmental uh, performance. But the difference between, uh, uh, sorry, the difference emerges between those who have a low versus high environmental consciousness as you progress along. So those with low environmental consciousness, while there's a difference, it's a bit smaller, <clears throat> medium or moderate environmental consciousness, the difference gets bigger, and high environmental consciousness, the difference gets bigger again. So people who are concerned about the environment are much more likely to buy from a high-performing uh, company than a low-performing company than those who don't, um, which all makes sense. Then on the right-hand side, we have the external reason, which is price. Um, and again, high environmental performing company in the light green. When the price is low, you can see there's a big difference between high and low performing companies, but when the price is high, that difference reduces. And we get uh, what's referred to as an ethical tipping point, that people are prepared to be ethical to a point when it starts to cost too much money. And that's, that's a big impediment on people um, um, behaving sustainably and buying environmentally friendly products. So let me go through some more of these particular reasons. <clears throat> so what hinders climate-friendly consumer behaviour? 
Um, first of all, we get a range of reasons that I'm presenting as, as what I would call personal or individual or internal. Um, so not knowing what to do or what products to buy, that's a very common answer that we get when I've, when I've looked at this in other research uh, that I've done. Don't know what to do, don't know what products to buy, and we have no um, regulated national labelling system uh, to help us there. Uh, it doesn't exist. That would be a, a pretty good thing to do, in, in my view. Uh, Second one is not believing your behaviour will make a difference. And that's an issue of what's called self-efficacy, that uh, people might say, well, I'm only one person. Uh, what I do isn't going to make a difference, so what's the point? Um, um, there are, of course, counters to all of this. Um, but that's certainly another reason people say. Another one is to do with lack of urgency or the fact that, that climate issues, for example, are abstract. So there's something called construal-level theory. So construal-level theory suggests that when something is in the immediate future or right now, we construe it with a sense of urgency. But where if it's in, in the future, it's or too far in the future, it's very abstract. Um, and so the future is this sort of unknown country that we, we've never been to and we don't necessarily get affected by it. Um, and that's an issue with trying to, with a lot of other behaviours. So asking young people not to smoke because you might get sick later on in life has the same sort of, uh, same sort of issues. Um, so you've got to try and make it urgent and you've got to try and make it immediate. Habit is another thing. People generally continue to do the behaviour that they've always done. The best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour. Um, and then lack of faith in green products performance. And this is less of an issue now, but certainly when I was first researching the area, people generally thought that green products were not as high performing as non-green products. And I think that's, that's less of an issue now. And the external things are, again, pretty much what you'd suggest. Uh, price, um, lack of availability um, of the product, uh, lack of convenience, um, not enough time to buy. So I, for example, do most of my food shopping directly after work and I just want to get home. I don't have enough time to look. And also social influence. It's not the norm for the people that you're involved with, so you don't do it. Now, um, how do we change that? Well, the most obvious thing to do, uh, and what sounds obvious, is to make climate-friendly behaviour the easier one to do. So it's to make sustainable behaviour easy to do. Now, that's not as straightforward as it sounds. Um, because people, like I said before, don't necessarily know what the climate friendly behaviour is. So you have to, in that case, make known and encourage change in the most impactful behaviours. So we need to make people aware of what are the behaviours that are actually decreasing our sustainability. And they are these four things. <clears throat> Air travel. Air travel produces a vast amount of carbon um, and it's likely to go up by... Um, quite a big percentage, uh, at least uh, triple uh, by 2030, pandemics notwithstanding. Um, eating meat from ruminants is an issue as well. So, and that's not just, so it's beef, sheep, goats, and things like that. Um, and that's not just with methane produced, but it's also to do with land use and land use degradation that occurs from, um, from needing to graze um, this sort of cattle. The third one's poor weatherization of our dwellings. And this is specifically about heating and cooling. Um, we, we uh, and in, in certain parts of Australia, uh, indeed, do not have very good weatherproof dwellings. Um, and so we lose a lot of uh, energy um, because we've not actually weatherproofed properly. And the fourth one is low versus high uh, energy efficient appliances. They make quite a big difference. So refrigerators, dishwashers, microwaves, cooling, any, anything like that, uh, water heaters and the like. And so you replace with something else, knowing that you, know, you need to know what they actually are. The other thing we've found is that if you emphasise the personal benefit, what will I personally get out of it? You're also more likely to sway people that are on low environmental consciousness. So they don't care too much about the environment, but you say, well, this is the benefit that you personally will receive from doing this. They're much more affected by that. And the other thing too, is you can link collective action with tangible positive outcomes. And that gets around the issue of self-efficacy. I personally, as a one person, don't feel I could do anything. If you emphasise, say, no, not you, maybe not you personally, but if we all did this or all of our organisation did this or um, um, indicating to people that, you know, if we reduce, um, you know, our carbon um, expenditure by um, 1%, it, 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 you know, it would in essence produce, save enough energy to light up a small city, uh, which is possibly true. And so the last slide I'll just, and I'll finish on this one, uh, is... Um, these are areas of focus that people can actually look at. Lifestyle changes. What can you do 
uh, to to not necessarily you know do voluntary go as far as voluntary simplicity, but you can do things such as buying a more sustainable products, for instance, which requires uh, uh, requires um, appropriate labelling. You know, re reduction or alteration of necessities, weatherproof your house. You need to have it. You need to use, make use of energy, but try and reduce the amount of energy that you make use of. Re reduction in luxuries. Do we actually all need to travel overseas every year? Reduction in waste, um, which, uh, which I'm sure Catherine will talk about as well. Takes up less space, produces less gas, and the like. Substitution. So substitute uh, um, inefficient products for much more efficient products. Again, within the constraints of what you can actually do. And then adoption, adoption of new behaviours, because if you start a behaviour off, you're more likely to keep doing it. And I'll, um, I'll finish there and I'll pass back over to Rebecca. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, it, look, it was really fascinating. I love the idea of the national labelling um, system. I use a similar one when I'm buying my children's cereal, the STAR system. So I'm thinking a national labelling system um, in this space and sustainability would be fantastic. Um, look, first of all, I'd just like to encourage everybody to continue to add um, their questions as we hear from, from Catherine now. Um, it will allow us to have a really rich conversation um, after Catherine's presentation. But Catherine, I think you're going to reveal some exciting student projects and through these explore what we can learn from them and how we can bring about change in our daily lives and workplaces. Uh, thank you very much, Martin and Rebecca. Um, so today I am joining you from Lutruwita, Tasmania, and I'm physically sitting in Nipaluna, Hobart, between Timtumili, Minanya, the river, and Kunyani, the mountain. And I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Moanina people who cared for this country, uh, land, sea, and sky for over 60,000 years. Um, in the work that we do, we need to recognise the impact of colonisation for Aboriginal people and to work out how we can decolonise our practices today. So I'd like to pay uh, respects to the Palawa Pakana people who continue to care for this country. We work for a future that respects Aboriginal people, culture, language and knowledge. And in a university environment, it's important that we recognise that knowledge not only exists in papers and stored on servers and in libraries, but that knowledge lives within us in stories and places. And I'd like to extend my respect to other First Nations people who may be joining us today as well. So my name is Catherine and my role, as Rebecca said, is as a Senior Sustainability Officer. And today I'd like to talk about how change for sustainability has happened here at the University of Tasmania and to talk specifically about how we do this working with student projects. Um, and if we look at the opening question for our presentation, how can we make change for sustainability? It's important to recognise that sustainability does not mean maintaining our current context or business as usual that there are complex challenges, injustices, inequality, biodiversity loss and climate change in the current ways in which we live on both our local and our global scales. So how do we transform to a way of living that allows us to have equity and justice between people, to have flourishing societies, biodiversity and a climate that's healthy for people and other species? We recognise that climate, the climate emergency is here and that it's no longer a case of convincing each other about what is happening, but instead working out what it is that we can do today. So I'm very lucky to work on a program that's called SIPS. It stands for our Sustainability Integration Program for Students. And I'm going to share with you today um, projects that many students have worked on over the past 10 years. Our program um, has three objectives. Um, and firstly, we want to ensure that we can continue to run a foundational project program for students to support the operational sustainability needs of the university by broadly engaging with students and staff and to provide opportunities for academic engagement with on-campus sustainability. And this means that we work with uh, research students, honors, masters and PhD students and we're also looking for academic uh, mentors for our student projects as well. Uh, last year, the work that we do 
uh, was recognised with an Australian and New Zealand award for student engagement. And this award recognised that the creativity and critical inquiry that we bring to the projects that we work on uh, allows us to work for change. Um, as I mentioned, uh, our program has been running now uh, with my colleagues since 2010. And we started off with a focus on uh, in-class uh, projects informed by operational uh, sustainability and academic research. Um, and in 2016, uh, this work was recognised um, as the university began to offer paid internships for students. Um, our program has continued to grow and two years ago, we received ongoing funding, uh, and this really allowed us to offer more opportunities for students and to shift our focus uh, to hosting our honours, masters and PhD students as well. Uh, you can see on the box in the box on the side uh, that we've had over 2,550 students involved in the program uh, with academic and professional staff mentors from each of the different colleges and areas of the university. Um, what we're doing is trying to work with a diverse group of uh, students so that we can offer lots of different opportunities. Um, and we do this through having uh, internships, fellowships, uh, in-class projects where students work in small groups on a sustainability challenge, as well as being able to offer placements where students come and work with us in the office for course credit. And then, as I mentioned, we host research students as well. Uh, we have some guiding principles that allow us to work towards change. Um, and first of all, we want to ensure that each of our projects is meaningful. And that means that we're working with real data and real people. Uh, we want to be authentic. So we're looking for the staff and the students who are already making change and working out what we can do to support them. Uh, we are working to build a shared sense of community identity around each of our programs. So when we work with a biodiversity topic, we're looking to create a community of people who are interested in supporting this work going forward into the future. And we like to embrace the passion and complexity of the challenge. And that means that we might uh, have a student apply for our program who's incredibly interested in soil health. And maybe that wasn't something that we were aware of as a project topic, but we try to um, enable and work with uh, students so that they can do something that they're really passionate about. And um, as I mentioned before, we try to intentionally design our program so that we have diversity. We have a diverse group of students uh, working from different backgrounds and different areas of interest. Um, and we do this through um, working across 10 different themes. And each year we try to ensure that we have at least one project that's working towards one of these themes. Um, and as you may see, there is some uh, crossover with the sustainable development goals. So we're also looking at how can we identify the real challenges that need to be worked on um, and looking at these from an international, not, not just a local perspective. Um, you might have noticed that climate change was missing from our list of themes, and that is because it is an overarching uh, goal that we work towards. And it has been part of our program since our students and staff first started working together uh, 12 years ago now. Um, the image that you see on the screen may be familiar to you. It's uh, created by Ed Hawkins, who's a climatologist uh, four years ago. And it shows us how the temperature has been changing over the last 70 years. So today we know that we have already reached globally uh, 1.2 degrees warming and that what we need to do next and continue to do is to take action and there are many ways that we can do this and we also know that the action that we take will have an impact and a key question for us is how can we uh, ensure that we are able to both prepare for and respond to climate change risks and this ability um, is affected by our understanding of those risks. Um, so this is work done by Susie Burke and Fritz and others. Um, and it tells us about the mental health impacts of uh, climate change. 
um, and it's organised into three categories. So we can see that there are direct impacts of climate change. And if you think about things like um, disasters, like bushfires or floods, you might be able to identify that there are direct impacts. And secondly, uh, vulnerable people, vulnerable communities experience greater social, economic and environmental change through climate change. Um, and that's something you can see today, potentially uh, through um, food insecurity and housing conditions in Tasmania. Um, and thirdly, we have emotional responses, uh, distress and anxiety, which come about through our response and understanding of global environmental risks. So it's really important that we're aware of this and that we're actively working so that we can continue to live and work and make a difference within this context. Um, there are some resources that are freely available that we use, but also are available to you as well. Um, one of those is a great uh, webinar that we ran called Wellbeing in a Changing Climate. Uh, there are resources around Active Hope that was um, written by Joanna Macy. And Tasmania has uh, the Climate Resilience Network as well as resources available through Psychology for a Safer Climate as well. So coming back to the uh, areas that I mentioned earlier, these are the things that we keep in mind when we're designing projects with students. Um, how can we uh, work on meaningful projects, ones that involve real data and real people? Uh, how can we be authentic in the work that we're doing and find the people who are already helping and work out how we can support them? How can we build uh, projects that enable us to create a shared sense of community identity and making sure that we're making the most of the passion that students bring as well as um, being authentic about the complexity of the challenges we face um, and making sure that we're designing uh, and intentionally involving uh, lots of different people in the projects that we do. So one of the projects that I wanted to talk about is the Climate Cafe Nipaluna program um, and this is a partnership program with social work uh, and we work with uh, Dr J Jocelyn Baltra Buloa and we partner with social work in order to build on the skills that students are learning through their masters of social work about how they can prepare for and respond to support people experiencing climate change. Uh, climate cafes are run internationally um, and also online as well so you might have heard of them before. Uh, climate cafes are places where you can come to talk about your experiences and how you're responding to learning about climate change and a place for you to listen and uh, hear other people's stories as well. Um, they're not necessarily a place where you will learn more about climate science and often they're not a place where you can buy tea and coffee. Uh, sometimes they have a barista but not all the time. And so our program that we run here at UTAS, um, Climate Cafe Nipaluna, is a specific partnership that we've created between SIPS and Social Work. Um, and each of the Climate Cafe sessions were co-designed uh, by a group of 12 Social Work students working together. Um, and the students are trained in group facilitation and they facilitate the conversations that happen at the Climate Cafe because we know that talking about our, our experience, learning about climate change enables us to then take act action. Uh, we also host uh, citizen science biodiversity days. And you can see some photos on your screen from days that were organized by Zoe and Inc. Uh, days such as the wild, wild pollinator count. And these happen twice a year internationally as well. Um, and you can take part even in your backyard as well. Um, surveying for biodiversity not only helps us understand what is living around us, but helps us to connect with place as well. Uh, we also run BioBlitz uh, days, and these usually involve students from biological sciences and zoology, uh, but you can do this even if you're not studying a science degree. There's a great free app that's called iNaturalist, and that allows you to record and identify species that you find around you. Um, and I have a photograph on the screen uh, taken by one of our alumni, uh, Keith Martin-Smith. 
um, other projects that we do in order to reduce waste to landfill. So thinking about that message around meaningful data and change. Uh, two years ago, we had students working with us, Christoph and Joy, who helped us uh, to analyze whether it would be a good idea to uh, set up some recycling walls. And we now have 23 recycling walls across the university campuses. And these allow us to uh, collect hard to recycle items. So items that can potentially be recyclable, but aren't able to be recycled in your usual commingle recycling bin. And these are a really good uh, physical reminder when you come on campus that sustainability is important to us and that we can uh, be involved in this challenge and take action as well. Uh, likewise, we are um, involved working with classes um, to do waste audits. And these are a really important way for us to better understand the types of waste that we're producing and to work out how we can reduce that waste as well. Um, and then we get involved in uh, education and particularly waste education in order um, to raise awareness about what you can and can't do, um, how we can divert materials from landfill and increase composting in particular. Um, so to uh, finish up, I wanted to come back to the ways in which we design our projects and how even though we work across these very broad, uh, distinct themes, uh, we are always looking to ensure that we have uh, real data and real people so that the projects that we do can be meaningful. Uh, we're looking for authenticity um, and building a shared sense of community identity and making sure that we make the most of the passion that people bring to their projects and the complexity of the issues that we face and uh, designing our projects so that we have a diverse range of people involved in every step along the way. Uh, thank you very much. That was um, fantastic, Catherine. Thank you so much. It's just wonderful to see um, the high level of engagement of our students actually and um, certainly some of those slides that you showed, you know, uh, as, as staff member here at the university, we, we now see all those co-mingling bins and various things that we can interact and make it easier for us to, to change our patterns of behaviour as well. So thank you so much. Now's an opportunity to go to the question and answer, perhaps the more interesting part, or at least an opportunity for everybody to engage. As I said before, um, please put your questions into the question and answer bar and we'll try to get to all of them um, as we work through the next part of the presentation. Um, but we do have a few questions that were submitted earlier, um, and I'm happy to go to those first. Catherine, this may be one for you, actually. You touched on um, some of those waste audits that were done. Um, the question's really about where does Tasmanian co-mingled recycling go? What is the net benefit of recycling in Tasmania after transport, processing, disposal of contaminated materials, etc.? Thanks, Rebecca. I think that that's a really good uh, question. It's very difficult to work out uh, where our recycling actually ends up. We have two materials recycling facilities in Tasmania, and that's where um, our recycling goes when it leaves your house or your university. Um, and that's where materials are sorted before they go to the mainland for processing. Um, and then we have one facility in Voronex in northern uh, Tasmania that processes uh, plastics here. Um, but it's a really big question about where it goes and what it is actually made into. And um, I think that's one of the really good challenges with the recycling walls as well, because if you put something like a printer cartridge in the recycling wall, you want to know where that's going and what it's being made into. And if the ink from that printer cartridge is being made into a new pen, is there then the opportunity for you to buy a pen that was made from that printer cartridge? So um, I think this type of um, installation helps to set that challenge for us um, and how we can close the loop and have more of a circular economy as well. If I can just add to uh, to that, Rebecca, it's a very good question. Um, I think even if we even if we're not exactly sure where 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 the recycled product ends up, it's an important behaviour nonetheless because it's something that people feel they have some control over. Mm -hmm. So it, it's one of the one of the easiest in terms of uh, 
uh, environmentally friendly behaviours to do and, and to predict whether people are going to do them. And once you start doing a behaviour, you're more likely to continue doing it. So we'll hopefully have, you know, leak over effects into other behaviours. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, so uh, we were perhaps talking about this beforehand as well. It really is quite interesting about how we affect um, people's behaviours and then kind of the positive effect that that can have um, across across the um, their behaviour, you know normal behaviours, daily behaviours as well. So, Martin, while you were presenting, there was a question that came up um, around transport, especially cars and the impact that that has. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? Oh, oh certainly. Um, and I think, um, look, that uh, that's actually a very, good, a very good point, which I probably should have mentioned as well, is that clearly, you know, the, the production of um, exhaust uh, is, is in many respects if not as pound for pound, uh, um, negatively impactful as air travel, it certainly is very negatively impactful. And and we've all been to cities where you know heavy rely, heavily reliance on car transportation, which just changes the livability of the environment, amongst other things, uh, as well. Um, so I think I think um, the the notion then of of if you consider one of the things you can either substitute or adopt is you know if it is and again this is in, this is income dependent obviously it is either lower um, um, hybrid cars uh, um, or indeed electric cars, uh, which produce far less, um, obviously produce far less emissions and or very few emissions indeed. Um, and that would, that would definitely make a difference if we had a, a more collective way of actually doing that. Well, Martin, actually, there's a specific question as well around the university's approach to that. Would you be um, able to give some um, ideas what the university's doing specifically? Oh, and with... yeah, Captain's probably better than me on that. But I would, you know, oh. I think the notion we were, we already have some um, electric vehicles as part of our the university's um, uh, car fleet, and, and I think if we, you know, we we would certainly be interested in considering a runway whereby we pick a point at which we um, we we move to all hybrid or all electric. Lovely. And Catherine, did you have anything else? Yeah, I, I agree, Martin. I think um, this is part of the mission reduction strategic plan that we launched earlier this year. So there's a plan to um, have an all-electric vehicle fleet as well. Wonderful. Well, that kind of leads into a question that we had submitted earlier as well. So not just cars, but if we were building the campus um, from scratch with an eye to sustainability, what would you do and what would you not do? Oh, I'll, I'll, well, two things I'll say immediately is proper weatherization of buildings, <laughs> definitely, mm -hmm. uh, and, and based off of what I was just saying before, and also energy efficient uh, appliances uh, where possible, uh, and looking at the, the best way we can use natural systems, uh, so passive heating, uh, for instance, uh, ways that we, we can... Um, design the spaces so that we're, we're making the most effective use of the natural environment uh, and we don't have to manipulate it at all. And then, of course, there's a whole lot of other issues about ensuring that where we source products from as best as possible has fewer carbon miles, uh, sourced locally, um, sustainable products, etc., etc. et cetera. Catherine, I've stolen all the things you were going to say probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, not all, some of them. No, I, I, think, I think that's great. Um, I think it's really important that... Well, I would like all universities to have a program like SIPS because I think this is where we can bring together what students are learning in the classroom and the um, academic expertise of people like Martin um, and professional staff as well. Um, we, we can make a change. So uh, like last year, we ran an energy audit of one of our buildings. And through that, we learned about the energy use of hair dryers, uh, hair dryers, hand dryers. And I didn't realize how much energy the older hand dryers were using. So they were able to be switched out for more efficient models. Um, and I think just involving people in decision making and change has a really big difference. So we can um, identify some things today, but those things will continue to change in the future. So having systems and processes set up so that people are involved and able to contribute is really important. So from that, Catherine, and this is one of the questions we've just been um, asked as well, is how do the university projects or the projects that um, have been undertaken at SIPS translate into sustainability more broadly for the community as well? Yeah, um, so uh, I'm thinking about uh, one example in particular. So um, in 
in a university environment, we have this luxury of being able to try things and experiment and find out if they work and then uh, communicate them more broadly with the community as well. Uh, so we have the luxury of being able to try things like the recycling walls. Uh, we have a new on-site composting machine um, that's about to start running in Launceston as well. Um, and we have, because we have this ability to try things, um, we have time and resources um, before we share things with people. That's wonderful. And um, Catherine, people are interested in know, are the projects only generated by uh, student ideas or can members of the public actually become involved in making project suggestions as well? There's clearly some people who are listening who have got some ideas they'd like to share with you. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, anybody can suggest a project idea, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Well, certainly after this, we'll encourage everybody. We put up the alumni contact details and you're very welcome to to come through our office um, to provide ideas to Catherine as well. So I'm sure she'll be inundated with things. Now, if you excuse me, I'll have to read the next question, Martin. It's from you, but it's um, quite detailed. So um, put your listening ears on as, as I go through it. Um, we have um, uh, somebody who's listening who said, my PhD addressed how consumer behaviour may change by providing agency for change through a change in the design of environments within retail spaces and the activities encouraged with them, within them. Have you any comments on how behaviour may change if we make a systemic change to offer diversity to the dominant consumer paradigm? Um, I think that came from Kirsty, um, who I know. Um, so <laughs> thanks, Kirsty, for your, for your question. Um, look, that's a, that's a very, very good point. And I think Catherine's uh, presentation also touched on um, touched on that too about about providing diversity. Now I, I think it it sort of relates to what I said earlier about if you can get people to start a behaviour, they're more likely to continue it. And so I, I think part of what you've described in in, you know, in retail spaces is starting to look at well, how can you provide a diversity of experience so that people are exposed to different options and exposed to different ways of doing things. And if they're exposed to it, it's like the old adage, you, you can't be what you can't see. So if you can tell people and assist people in um, how to adopt a certain sort of behaviour, that they're much more likely to actually do it. Um, and so you make it easy for them as much as you can. You make the behaviour easy for them. So if you can design a retail environment, which is fantastic, that, that encourages the diversity of behaviour, then um, that can only be a good thing. Um, I, and I think people are interested. My, uh, we've, with with my one of my collaborators, we've just done some work, for instance, on uh, shopping for secondhand clothes. And there's a lot of interest in shopping for secondhand clothes. And interestingly enough, and this is how you can you can actually make this work really well, the best predictor of whether someone shops for secondhand clothes isn't what we thought, which we thought was going to be frugality and concern about the environment. The biggest predictor was style consciousness when you were aware of style and especially amongst younger people. So that's something that you can you can really play on to create that sort of diversity of experience by saying, no, 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 there's lots of ways of thinking about, you know, what it means to be a secondhand shopper, or in this case, which in this case is a more sustainable shopper um, because you know, fast fashion is one of the biggest producers of, of wastewater and, and all sorts of other nasty things. Um, and you promote the behaviour that you want, uh, by promoting you know, the good aspects of it. But Martin, do you think this behaviour is with people who are already inclined to be wanting or thinking about changing their sustainable behaviour? One of the questions we have is really what do we do with the proportion of the community who might deny the science of climate change um, and the need to make changes for sustainability? How do we get through to these people? Yeah, well, that, that's a really, it's a very, very good question. And, and if we had a, a, a fast answer to that, we'd be, we'd be in a much better spot. Um, You've look, got it, 10 minutes, Martin. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, it, it depends, I think, on the, the motivation of the, beha of the behaviour. So it, it, there's obviously um, a, a climate change denying that goes on for rational and non-rational reasons. Now, if, you, if it goes on for a non-rational reason, providing more information isn't going to help, okay? Uh, it's, it's sort of, if you want to change the behaviour, you've got to ch change the belief, you've got to match the belief at some particular level. So it depends on whether it's, you can't match emotion with logic uh, or you, it, it's not as easy to do it like that. 
the best thing I can suggest is you practice what you preach mm. and you allow people to observe what you do, how it makes a difference in your life and how you believe it makes a difference for everybody else. Um, you know, I've got family members who are not inclined that way and there's no point in me talking to them about it because they just get annoyed um, and I get annoyed. Um, so on the other hand, I just adopt the behaviours that I'm comfortable with and if they learn from that, that's terrific. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, and obviously another avenue is is our young people. I mean, you mentioned before about the style consciousness and, and um, buying clothes and things as well, but um, one of our commenters has just said that Sustainable Living Tasmania is running um, energy-focused projects um, in six high schools throughout Tasmania at the moment, which sounds amazing. So it sounds a little bit like SIPs, as they've described it, in high schools. However, they said one of the challenges they're facing is how insanely busy teachers are. Um, so, Catherine, have you faced this with SIPs and how have you tackled it? Uh, we, I agree, uh, but um, we don't work directly with uh, teachers and schools. Um, so um, we don't have the same, the same challenge. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think um, it's very useful, though, that uh, sustainability is a cross-curricular priority mm -hmm. for schools. Um, yeah. I suppose it could be, you know, do we find still students are busy? I mean, how do you get students engaged in SIPs to start with as well? They have other calls on their time. They're doing, you know, sometimes very intense courses. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that what, what drives students to join SIPs and, and take part in these projects? Yeah, so this probably relates to what Martin was just talking about as well. So in the program, we intentionally have different streams in which students come and work with us. So we have the paid internships and fellowships, and mm. we have students that apply through a competitive application process each year. Um, and then we also have students that are given placement projects by their unit coordinator. And in that case, they haven't chosen the project and they're coming to work with us for work experience. Mm -hmm. um, and we do this because we want to work with a really broad range of students on projects. Um, and this allows us to talk to different communities that we might not usually talk to. Um, one of the interesting projects that we did last year was working with a um, student um, who speaks Arabic and her project was about um, creating an Arabic language uh, sustainability tour for the campus. Uh, so she took the points that we already have on the tour, things like where you can fill up your water bottle and where there's a water sensitive garden. And she tried to work out how to translate this into Arabic. Um, and she reached out to uh, universities and other academics from different parts of the world in order to work out how, how to talk about these different things um, in her language. And this uh, opens the door and invites in a whole different community of people that uh, we weren't talking with. Um, so we try to work with students in a way that is creative and allows us to work with different uh, communities across the university as well. Yeah, that's, um, that's amazing, actually. That's really great to hear as well. And is that project going to be rolled out um, even further, Catherine, or where is it at at the moment? Yeah, so um, Ash has finished, but mm -hmm. um, it's able to be picked up by any other student. So you could run it in, in any language. It just happened that Ash spoke Arabic. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. So another question I um, saw during um, the pandemic or perhaps last year, our numbers doing SIPs wasn't so high, um, but more broadly, not just the participation in SIPs, but have behaviours um sustainability behaviours changed since the pandemic? Yeah, that's um, a good news thing, actually. So we shifted our program in order to, we because we got ongoing funding, we have more staff time as well as more paid student uh, time than we had in previous years. And that means that we can host uh, more students who are doing longer term projects. So we can work with students like uh, honours research students that will be with us for a whole year. Uh, and support PhD research as well, um, as well as accepting more placement students, um, interns and, and fellows. Um, so we have uh, less uh, in-class projects. Uh, that uh, is why the overall numbers dropped, right. but the actual um, outcomes and value of the projects that the students have, are doing has increased. 
Great, thank you. Um, and Martin, we have a question here which, like, interests me and I, I touched on earlier, which is around labelling um, for, for so consumers can make informed decisions. Um, you know, it's really hard to research every brand, brand that you use. Often labelling can be inconsistent, misleading. What measures would you like to see on consumer packaging which allows consumers to compare products um, mm. from a holistic environmental mm. perspective? Yeah, th thanks so much. That's actually a very, very good question. There's a few aspects to that. That there is an issue, I suppose, uh, to first work out who's responsible. Uh, so, if it's a national system, which which particular national authority should administer it, or is, is it a state-based system, or even a local system? Um, and and so, I think at at some point, um, um, you know, um, entities such as the ACCC, the Australian Competition. Uh, yeah, Forget what the second C stands for, but it doesn't matter, you know what I mean. Um, mm. um, would be a, a good avenue to pursue that through. Once you decide who, who has the authority, the second bit is what are you actually going to make, compare products on? Um, and so you need to produce, decide what the metrics are basically. So if you have a labeling system, you've got to work out what you're measuring in order to differentiate products. And that's where consumers have the most difficulty is trying to say, well, if I'm going to work out if this is a better or a worse product to buy from a environmental point of view, uh, how do I do that? So at the moment, there's a number of industry-based um, systems. So the, the dolphin-friendly tuna uh, stuff, for example, mm -hmm. is an industry-based mm -hmm. one. Even the Heart Foundation tick is industry-based. It's not, a, it's not a completely independent authority, uh, that uh, government authority that does that. Um, and so then you think, well, what am I going to do it on? Um, and so there's a number of things you could do. So you, there is such a thing as life cycle pricing. And so life cycle pricing takes into account the energy consumption in total terms required uh, to produce that particular product. Um, and that takes into account things such as um, carbon miles, um, the, the energy required to produce the actual product and things like that. Um, and you can model that. I mean, that, that's, you know, you put in a few predictors and, uh, of what it is and then you, you, you can model that. The other is to estimate the carbon usage over the life cycle of the product, particularly if it's something like a, a dishwasher. Or, or, a, um, or a refrigerator. And that's, again, industry-based to some extent. The other thing too, you can actually have a, a more precise stab at carbon miles. You know, how far has the product come from? Mm -hmm. uh, and a quick and, a quick and dirty way of doing it, which gets to a couple of the other questions about how can you nudge people in a retail environment, is you just hold the shop local. If it's locally sourced, it's more likely to have a lower carbon footprint and thus more likely to be better. It's a very mm -hmm. easy, simple way uh, and, and so I strongly encourage consuming locally of, of what's actually produced. And that, that also fits in with a lot of other C, uh, schemes, um, such as the slow food movement. Slow food is all about good, clean and fair. Um, um, and part of all that does involve seasonality, you know, eating food that is available at a particular time of the year where you happen to live, uh, because that way it's, it's less likely to have cost a lot to actually get it where you are. Yeah, look, that's great. Thanks so much, Martin. Look, we're bumping up against time and I can see that there's still like heaps of questions we haven't got to. So I'm feeling like there might be another explore on sustainability coming up very, very soon. But Catherine, I'll just give you a quick one or perhaps it's not so quick. Um, given that you did the um, audit um, of all of the, the rubbish and things, are there products that um, we should be all avoiding as well? Uh, I think... There's a good response here that ties into Martin's uh, response before. Usually when we do the audit, the thing that we find in all the bins is coffee cups and coffee lids. So with very good intentions, uh, people uh, put coffee cups thinking that that's where they go in landfill recycling and compostables. Um, and uh, labelling would really help us with that. Um, we're somewhat lucky uh, at Utah's because... Um, any coffee cup that you get on campus, um, we know it goes in the green bin, it goes in your FOGO bin uh, because it's um, all uh, commercially compostable, uh, the coffee cup and the lid. Uh, but if you're bringing a coffee cup from outside the university, um, we don't necessarily know that. So, um, yeah, going back to what Martin just said, uh, labelling would, would really help with this. Yeah. 
Thank you. Well, look, thanks so much, um, both Catherine and Martin. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm sure everybody will join me, albeit silently, because you're all on silent, thanking today's speakers, Martin and Catherine. Um, this afternoon, we've really seen a terrific example of the expertise that we have here within our alumni community. There will be a recording of this afternoon's presentation available soon for, um, on our YouTube channel, which you can access through the Explore website and the link is now on your screens as well. We'll be continuing the Explore online series throughout the year, probably another one on sustainability if the number of questions that we receive today is any indication. But they're really an opportunity to um, for self-progression and creativity, so keep a look out for further invitations. Of course, we'd love to know if there are other issues or topics that you'd like to explore, or perhaps you're a member of the alumni community um, who'd like to offer your exp expertise. If so, please reach out to the team via the contact details on your screens. I was really pleased to tell you there's an opportunity for you to join upcoming online public lectures as part of the Island of Ideas uh, this Thursday at 5.30 p.m. The lecture, as we can see, is on the future of work housing and communities in crisis. Join experts, including alumnus Danny Sutton and alumna Dr. Kathleen Flanagan to discover how we might promote a fairer Tasmania. Also upcoming on the Thursday, the 14th of July at 6 p.m. is the 2022 Giblin Lecture, Great Expectations, Achieving Gender Equity in Our Lifetime. Join alumna Dr. Angela Jackson and discover how we might achieve gender equality in Australia in this lifetime. And the link to register is at the bottom of your screens if you're interested in attending. But now this brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thank you so much to everybody for participating. As I said, we had a huge number of questions to get in uh, through today. And I apologize if we didn't have an opportunity to specifically address yours. But thank you again for taking part in the event. Thank you, Catherine and Martin, and good afternoon. Thank you.